welcome to the Hacking Your Health podcast with Ben Kenning and Dave Kennedy. Two guys heading out to hack body, mind, business, and beyond. We are here to provide a single source, bullshit-free guide to understanding your body and how you can live better for longer. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. I am Ben Kenny. And I'm Dave Kennedy. And this is Hacking Your Health Podcast. Woo woo. What's up? Not much, man. Just got done. <clears throat> excuse me. Just got done with my, uh, well, I was just got done eating, but uh, I just got done with my lift session for today. So uh, appreciate the uh, the additional programming you did. I, one of the sets was, uh, you know, you probably will die. So, uh, you know, it's that was pretty accurate. <laughs> How many reps <laughs> until almost death? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, it was good though. I got a I got a salad PR in on um, on my bench press today, uh, which I liked a lot on the uh, Kabuki Cabard bar, the neutral grip bar. Uh, I was up to two sixty five on that, and I uh, got um, six uh, six reps on that. So I was pretty impressed with with that one. I hadn't hadn't done it before. Two forty five at six was my last one. So uh, it's really good. Uh, it's not a traditional bench press. It's uh, it limits the shoulder. So I don't want you know my my bench press is much stronger than that. I just want to throw that out there. Um, <laughs> Just in case anybody's in the comment, but like pussy. Yeah, he's like, oh, he's got a 265, really? We listen to these guys, you know? (laughs) Unfollow. Yeah, it it takes your shoulder out of the equation because I was having uh, shoulder issues, uh, left left shoulder tear. So I, uh, the Kabuki Can bar bar is kind of like um, locks. It's Kabuki Cambered bar. Uh, It's called the Cadillac bar, actually. Um, It locks your um, arms into position and um, allows you to really um, focus on your chest and obviously some triceps into that as well. So uh, do enjoy that. And uh, I was a solid workout. I got to do a military press for the first time on a, on a Smith machine. So I hadn't done that before. I did traditional military presses, you know, with barbells or neutral grip bars or log presses and those types of things. But um, real solid on the uh, the Smith machine. I tell you, man, I love that Smith machine. It's like uh, it's my favorite thing that I think I've ever purchased. Uh, that and the tonal are probably like my two staple things that I really enjoy doing. It's, it's kind of sad because my bench uh, isn't getting as much love anymore. So like, I feel like I need to like just go down on my day off and just like say hi to it and, and say I appreciate all the memories. But I haven't been using the bench just as much. Sit, as just I sit in the middle. Just sit in the middle of it, eating your eating your lunch. Like just hanging out. I was <laughs> actually I, I was actually quite mindful of that whenever I was putting the second week of your program together because I didn't want to just abandon the things that we were doing. So. I was mindful that yes, okay, we have now the Smith machine and we have everything else that that, that is there. You're really distracting me with whatever you're doing for anybody who's not sorry, know, sorry, sorry. Re- re- rearranging the whole place. But uh, yeah, so I was mindful of that because I didn't want to just like solely move over to the Smith machine. But I think one of the one of the points that I wanted to make on the Smith machine is obviously whenever we start weightlifting, we start training you need to learn the skill of the movement. So you need to learn yeah. how to stabilize yourself. You need to learn how to move the weight. You need to learn what way your body moves, where you're feeling the muscle and everything else. But I find that when you get to a certain level, you need to almost take some of that out so you can just train the muscle directly. So you talking about the military press on the Smith machine, it takes a lot of that out because obviously it runs on the runner. So you're not having to create as much stability yourself. So it allows us to sort of push things in a slightly different direction. Um, and also it allows us like to be able to, to push the weight on it, that you're just focused on your shoulders, your triceps doing the movement and that you actually just trying to hold your body up together. Yeah. And it, 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 uh, it definitely felt better. And I was able to push, you know, more weight, obviously, I think because I was more stable with it, not as much as if I was standing though, uh, you know, you know, with stabbing, standing, you have your back stabilizer muscles and, you know, a little, and a lot of times what I'll do when I'm close to, you know, like my 10 RPE or, you know, basically uh, complete, uh, fatigue is I'll, I'll do um, push presses where, you know, I use my legs to pop up and then I go down really slowly and then I can go back up again when I when I have that muscle fatigue because I don't have the ability to move it up. Um, you kind of lose a little bit of that uh, when you're sitting down. But I did find that you could still kind of do the same thing where, you know, you stand up and then come down and just let your let your shoulders uh, go down, you know, with tension. So it was it was enjoyable. I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the workout session today. I appreciate putting the time in that. Yeah, I think as well, you know, the thing about the Smith machine, what I like about it is, you almost have something to push against so you can push it in a slightly different way because because it runs on the runners you can push against it and it's not going to go forward or go anywhere it's going to go up because the runners go up 
he's going to continue to distract me this entire time. No, I, gonna... I, my, 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 my mic felt the whole thing, like the whole arm, like crashed down. Hopefully you don't, you couldn't hear it on the podcast, but like, I was like, <laughs> oh shit. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying, I'm recovering right now temporarily to <laughs> get to here. <laughs> so you can push, you can almost push away because it will run on the runner. So it gives you a different sort of, I guess a different way to push it. But the flip side of it is because you're on the Smith machine, I assume it has like safety bars so you can set it, that you can actually get yeah. a failure that it'll catch it on the way down and you'll not injure yourself and not actually die. Yeah. Yeah, so there's like a, a spring mechanism that basically locks into the brackets, um, and then you can basically you know drop it to uh, a location where you you want it to stop at. I did the, I use those very heavily. Uh, was it yesterday for the rack pulls, um, where it's just below the cusp of the knee, uh, and then you know I had the springs there so I could you know load heavy on it. I'm, I was actually curious if it was gonna survive, like because I did five plates on each side. I was like, is this gonna actually hold? But it did. It, it, it worked out just fine. I did a, a bit of research on the G15. There is a weight restriction on the bar. It's is 400, there? It's 450 kilos. Like, so I think you're a while oh, yeah. away off it. Right? So that's, like, that's, like that's, that's, that's at least another two weeks away. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's good. I, there's a lot of attachments in that. Like, and there are a couple of things that I didn't program because I feel like I'll keep a couple of tricks up my sleeve that'll really fuck you up down the line. Yeah. It's, which I'm um... sure you're, you're excited for. Yeah, I love, dude, I, like a lot of the exercises that we're hitting, um, you know, the, uh, the cable extensions, the tricep cable extensions, cross cross cable extensions, um, I really love those. Like those were a new one for me that I hadn't tried before. And just, uh, you, I don't know what it is about that movie. It's like that one. And um, when you're doing uh, lateral pull downs and uh, rows, uh, la- um, uh, what are, yeah, uh, do, doing rows, like I feel like just like a big dude when I'm doing those, like especially like the tricep push ups, you got you got your muscles all like this, and you can see the definitions in your shoulders, yeah. just like pushing down. You're like, yeah, this is awesome, you know. Phil. So I uh, I really enjoy those those ones that we've, we've incorporated. And going, so, I'm <laughs> fist pump Cardi B. Yeah, Cardi B was there right next to me on the uh, on the uh, the military presses today, uh, cheering me on. So I uh, I went actually my 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 uh, my next playlist. You know, my my playlist is typically like like heavy rap and R&B and stuff like that. And then I'll throw some, you know, alternative or 90s grunge. I don't know if you're going to like my next playlist. It's it's pretty pretty intense. It's uh, it's going to be all super heavy metal, uh, screaming. That's and, good. And everything I'm okay else. with okay. that. Okay. okay. I like okay. to train. I like to train to that. So actually, okay. let me get, so do you build your next month's playlist out? So for example, next month is June. Have you started to build that playlist out already? I have. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So, so so it depends on how I'm feeling. So what, what I like doing, how I build my playlist out, is I'll get through like half of my playlist, um, you know, uh, through my, my normal month. You know, let's just say I'm doing Mace playlist. And I start to like think about like what other songs would I like to listen to if I was like, you know, getting into this. So I start to add. And sometimes like I really like like some songs and I'll add those songs again from the previous month because I just like them so much. Um, but I try to incorporate new songs and things like that. Well, I got into like a heavy metal kick. Oh, I, I know what it was. Uh so Dom, I've t- we talked to him about him a couple times in the show. He's uh, yeah, pers- I met him. <laughs> yeah, you met Dom uh, for for uh, for my kids that do uh, what's called nervous system training for for physical fitness. He's like a young twenties guy, and um, he's like probably twenty three, twenty four, and uh, just insanely strong, uh, big dude. And um, I was talking to him yesterday. He was training Morgan while I was doing uh, coaching basketball practice. And I, you know, I just happened to, he always listens to heavy metal. So I'm like, oh man, you should, you know, put on some, uh, well, my, my daughter actually brought it up. She's like, hey, my dad uh, was showing me, uh, we, we basically sat in the car for like an hour and um, just, uh, you know, I went through different like 90s genre music and I started getting a little bit more heavier into rock and she loves Metallica <laughs> and everything else. So I'm like, okay, well, what do you think of this? And I, 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 I uh, played a, a thing called, or a band called Cold Chamber, which is a pretty heavy metal band. And she's like, this is really awesome. I like it. And uh, and then I, I played Seven Dust and a few other ones uh, from the 90s. And um, and so uh, Dom was, you know, uh, Morgan goes to Dom. She's like, you should play some Seven Dust. And he's like, who's that? And I'm like, oh, man, I'm old. I'm like, damn it. You know, like this guy listens to heavy metal on a regular basis. He has no idea who Cold Chamber and Seven Dust were like the staples of heavy so metal in life. He's got like this 11-year-old girl telling yeah. him to put this yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. And he plays, he plays, he's like, this is awesome. I love it. I'm like, yeah, this is like, like, this is like number one in my area, man. You know, like when I was going, going how do you not know who Seven Dust and Cold Chamber is? I mean, seriously. So uh, I, now, then I got into this whole like metal kick and I was like, I was jamming to metal this entire time. And then I started getting into like a rabbit hole of like Sepultura and some like really straight, you know, uh, angry actually, music. So um, I'll actually send you Helmy's playlist. I think that you would like this going on, on that sort of conversation. It is like 
when you need to go to a dark place to do a big set, this is this is what you need. I'll send you the link. Not to just totally derail the the, the conversation about. Oh music. yeah. Have you listened to actually while we're talking about it, uh, Jack Harlow's album? It's yeah, the first, yeah. It's the first album in a very long time that I will willingly listen to the entire album. So that's interesting. Anybody his hasn't. his uh his first class song, which is a remake of Fergie's glamorous song. Um, mm-hmm. I love a lot. That's in my playlist this this month, uh, and I haven't listened to his his full album, so I'll have to check that out. Definitely, definitely, do really good album. Anyway, well, one last topic. Kendrick Lamar also released a new album, not as good as I expected it to be, but there are a couple of great <laughs> songs on it. I'm actually putting together a playlist in a minute. It'll be finished soon. I'll send Can we it listen to, you. to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's just updated on music <laughs> on the music scene. <laughs> So now everybody's updated on our, our Smith Press or Smith Machine uh, updates, our, our workout routines, uh, and everything else. Uh, oh, la- last thing I'll hit on on the, the whole health front is um, it was crazy uh, just talking about like weight fluctuations and things like that. And you know, this is why I think a good discussion on on weight being your barometer of things isn't necessarily a great measure of how you're doing. Um, so, you know, we have been gradually increasing calories, uh, trying to put on as much muscle mass as possible, doing it slowly too. Right. So we started doing it slowly, but a really yeah. fucking good job of it. We're yeah. doing a good job of building muscle. I would like to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the point, to the point where this week, Dave, spoiler alert, sent me his check-in photos the day before his check-in. Been like, I'm so this, happy. Look <laughs> I'm like, look, look at my quads. They're like blowing up here. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't wait for check and I had to show my quad. So, uh, um, you know, find, find a friend that you can do that to, you know, like, this exactly. is my quad. Look at this. You know, exactly. like, like, Oh my God, there's a vein there. Oh my God. You know, like, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, but, uh, uh, I, you know, what's interesting is, you know, I was, we were in a calorie deficit for a while, trying to kind of thin up a little bit for vacation and stuff like that to get the abs going and everything. And that, that went really well. And then, uh, we started again, increasing calories to get more towards the thing. And so, you know, we're up to, up to 2950 as far as calories go right at that 3000 mark of calories. And uh, I dropped five pounds in weight uh, in a week consistently. Like it was like, you know, like 41, 42, 41 or 241, 242, 241, 242, 241, 240, you know, like the whole week. And uh, and it's just crazy because like you're like, hey, we increase calories and you lose five pounds. It makes no sense whatsoever. But at the end of the day, like my measurements, you know, uh, you know, I have a uh, one of the I actually switched to this uh, slim pal. I was using the the starts with an R Renpo in the Renpo one. I had like three that broke. Um this slim pal is nice because it has like a little lock mechanism on it. So like it comes in and then when you slide it in, it actually locks into place like really well. It's not like this cheap okay, little yeah, plastic yeah. piece. Um, so I really like this one a lot. Um, so I switched to this, but my measurements have been perfect. Yeah. My, my waist was down, uh, I think a whole centimeter actually. Um, and my quad or my hips were down. Uh, and then my, all my measurements from chest, shoulders, everything else were all up. So, you know, obviously, you know, I dropped some pretty substantial body fat and it increased muscle mass during that, that week period. So, you know, again, you know, uh, calories are, are an interesting piece because, you know, I'm giving my body the amount of calories that I need to produce as much muscle as I can based on my training programs, which is so stupid because I'm training less now than I, I was before this plan. You know, I was overtraining essentially um, and I'm doing less cardio. So I'm only doing cardio twice a week. Uh, I have incorporated more steps. Uh, that's definitely a thing there uh, for sure. But uh, summertime, that type of stuff. But um, but overall, you know, it's it's crazy to see the amount of gains by increasing calories and really trying to push uh, calories, push the program, push the training. I mean, again, hitting PRs left and right now, uh, it's it's been pretty incredible. Yeah, and the calorie conversation is it's such a, a funny one because you know exactly like you said we're reducing the amount of actual time that we're spending training we're increasing the calories so you know what typical would would have been said before you need to eat less and train more we're doing the opposite of that and we're getting the effect that everybody else is trying to trying to get that's actually funny i was on the the we Hack health group training call earlier on and one of the guys on there basically last week didn't really go to plan for him, let's say, um, was over his calories. I think for the week he was over his calories by about 2000, which is absolutely fine. Cause I realize yeah. sometimes that, that happens and that's okay. And I actually on the call on Monday, like we do a weekly check-in call, I increased his calories to sort of balance that out. And he was a bit like, as almost as if he was getting rewarded for eating like the week before, <laughs> but it wasn't that my thought process and my reasoning behind that was because his average for the week was higher. If I bring him out uh, up, this week it is still going to be lower than last week and his body will respond and he came down i think again it was like maybe four or five pounds so he came down to an all-time low of of where we're at and i think he's down like 45 pounds total now but even that you know having a, a couple of days where your calories are 
significantly higher is obviously going to increase, you know, your subconscious movement. Like even me standing here with my hands, if I was really low on calories or I wasn't eating enough calories, I'd be like stuck to my desk and like hanging like this. So all those things that you do subconsciously are burning calories. So there is a lot to be said about having days that are maybe slightly higher to sort of push on fat loss that little bit extra. Science, man, it's fucking science. Dude. I'll, t- I'll tell you, it's it's crazy. You know, obviously there are um, genetic defects and things like that that can equate to you know obesity and things to that effect. But on general, you know, I was always brought up to think, well, hey, you just have a slow metabolism, okay? Or hey, it's okay to be overweight and heavy and all these other things, and and it's fine. And again, I'm not saying you know if you're overweight and that's where you want to be, that, that's that's fine with you. But it's it's unhealthy for me to be in that position. I was having heart surgeries. I was, you know, told I was going to be dead by 35 or 40 if I didn't you know change my 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 ways and um you know what i was again what i was always led to believe was well this is how i am i can't change this and my metabolism is slow where at the end of the day it's it's really just it is science it's it's the science of thermogenics it's the science of how your body works and burns and calories it's what you eat it's how much activity you perform it's the calories in versus calories out it's the macronutrients you're putting into your body and it's interesting we talk about this a lot but you know when we were pushing the upper threshold thresholds of 4000 I felt fucking amazing on that, right? You know, I had I had unlimited energy. I was bouncing off the walls. My workout routines were just like the most intense to where I'm screaming, you know, in the air and I have all the energy in the world, you know, and then, you know, and then you go down to 2000 calories or 2100 calories, which we're, we're really trying to push it. I, 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 you didn't want me to go down that far. I'm like, I want to go down that far. Um, I felt, you know, I had no energy. You know, you know I, a lot of things started tripping because, you know, I was like, I don't feel like going on walking or I don't feel like doing this. Your body really resonates with that and shuts down certain things and, and motivation based off of how many calories you have. And that's why I think, you know, when you look at these these diets that folks are putting themselves through, I mean, you get agitated, you get angry, um, you're you're really quick to set off, you know, to, to be um, upset because your body's angry and upset. Um, you don't have the energy to get you through the day. Uh, and you just feel like total crap. And, you know, again, it's it's interesting, you know, there's, you know, obesity is obviously a major problem. So we have ample amounts of calories, but the quality of food that you put into your body is also equally important. Um, so like, if you're just eating total shit all day, even though you're eating 4000 calories, you're going to feel like shit because you have cholesterol, you have all this fat, you have all this stuff that you're putting into your body that it's not used to. And so, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, yes, we can have slow metabolisms. That's actually primarily regulated by your thyroid uh, and your T3 cells. I have an under um, active thyroid because I had a thyroidectomy. Like I don't know if you can see the scar. Well, that's not a scar. That's a that's a pimple. But um, you can see I have a scar. A scar <laughs> just line below right the there. pimple. Just, just below, below the pimple. pimple there's a scar. <laughs> I have a scar line there where I had to do a partial thyroidectomy where they removed half my thyroid uh, because I had a thyroid nodule that was growing out of control. And um, so my thyroid levels, uh, you know, were fine uh, for about a year after I had my my thyroidectomy. And then um, they started dipping off because my thyroid couldn't um, maintain. So there's like enzymes that your body basically sends. And then there's the T3, T4 um, hormones in your body um, that are used. And so mine were like very underactive. So I take, you know, um, thyroid medicine to bump those levels up, which helps regulate um, your your overall uh, metabolism. So, you know, if, if you're if you are concerned about a slow metabolism, get your T3 levels, uh, your thyroid levels checked. Um, and see where those are and make sure that they're on nominal levels. And then, you know, obviously you supplement as necessary from a doctor prescribed, you know, Synthroid or things of that effect to, to help out with those T-levels. But again, at the end of the day, uh, the calorie thing is such an interesting topic because, you know, it, as you mentioned, if you eat a lot of calories for that week, your body gets adjusted to that. And then if you drop a thousand calories again, you're, you're crashing, your body goes into fight or flight mode where it's like, hey, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm, I'm going to, you know, hold on for dear life, which I'm going to shut down energy production. I'm going to shut down this. I'm going to do this. Whereas if you just do like 500, it's like, ah, I still got enough. We're good. And, uh, you know, you actually, you know, perform at pretty much the same type of level as you would at those type of calories. It's, it's really crazy. It's, it, your body's such a fascinating thing. Yes, your body's much smarter than you are. I think it's maybe the best <laughs> thing that we can say. The calories, you know, you see it a lot. And anybody who's listening, I'm sure, has been in a similar situation where they're like, oh, I need to eat 1,000 calories to lose weight. You're going to be fucking miserable. And yeah. everything that you do will be half fast. Your walks will be half fast and you'll be dragging your feet. Any cardio you do will be half fast. Your training will be half fast. You need to bring your calories up to increase the intensity of everything that you're doing. Now, all of that being said, and this is something I've been sort of putting a lot of the guys in the, in the client community through recently, 
with a bit of a caveat. So obviously we always talk about sustainability, longevity, everything that we're doing, you can do for a long period of time, which yes, I 100% stand by, but I do sometimes think that there is exactly like you talking about the 2100 calories. I do think there's sometimes wisdom in pushing the boundaries on that a bit. And again, you know, I had my call with James, my coach uh, yesterday. Um, and he basically asked me, he says, look, we're going to go through a fat loss phase first. Are you the sort of person that wants to do like a, a minimal deficit for a longer period of time? Or do you just want to get in and get out and get it done? I'm the person that wants to get in and get out and get it done because yeah. I would rather suffer, quote unquote, and put the work in for, you know, 60 a week, get where we are instead of doing it for like 16 to 20 weeks. But I only know that because I've done both and I know which one I respond better to. I'm like, okay, I can do this for six weeks. It's going to be hard as hell. And then we come back up the maintenance and then we reassess rather than like 20 weeks. I'm like, fuck that. Like, it's just, it's too long for me to sort of see ahead. So understanding what you can do, understanding the times that, okay, you can maybe push a little harder in terms of more steps, more cardio, less calories, but I'm still going to be within a pretty decent calorie. It's like, I'm still eating 3,200 calories. So it's not as if I'm going to starve. It's just about... How can we do that in a in a shorter period of time? Yeah, and uh, it's 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 really I, again. I you know I always go back to the whole weight thing. Like I would always freak out about weight um, because you know I'd see my weight tick up, and you know we we had you know shaved down and gone up and all this other stuff, and you know everybody wants to lose weight. I want to lose twenty pounds. Well, is that really what you want to do, or do you want to look great with your shirt off, or do you want to feel feel physically fit, or do you want to be physically fit? Um, you know, those are all key things that you have to ask yourself. And I think from a weight perspective, you should not use the weight as a scale. It's a, it's one data input for everything else in your program that you're looking at. So if you're increasing weight too fast, if you're gaining five pounds a week, well, that's probably problematic. You, there's no way to gain five pounds of muscle, uh, in a week, unless you're, you know, using horrible steroids that are destroying your body. Um, but, uh, you know, those, those types of things are, you know, not to be expected. So if you're seeing a fluctuation of five, well, you probably have too many calories. If you're, you know, if you're only gaining a pound or two a week, Hey, you're probably in the right, you know, barometer of calories, um, where you need to continue to push because a pound or two a week is about where you want to be at from a weight gain perspective. If you're in a caloric surplus, you know, same thing on the deficit side, you know, pound or two a week, uh, losing weight. If you're not losing one to two pounds and, you know, shave hundred, 200 calories. So it's, it's literally math, but sometimes the math doesn't make sense to me. It's like, Hey, we're going to increase calories. Five, you know, we haven't, we never do 500, but like, let's just say we go up 500 and I lose five pounds. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I don't understand this specific thing, but you know, there are other components to that, you know, around, you know, your body adjusting to it, you know, digestive tract can be another thing there. Um, you know, how much you're pushing yourself, um, because you have added calories. So maybe you're burning more calories as you're working out because you have more energy expenditure to, to deal with. So there are things there that, that all kind of equate to this. So it's not exact, but you can at least use that as an input to say, Hey, you know, this is, this is fine. But I'll tell you on the weight side, I don't care if I gain weight anymore. Like I, I don't, I really don't. Like if I get on the scale and I'm, you know, if I, if I eat like total garbage and I go up like four or five pounds or three pounds or a pound a day, I'll be like, dude, like I, that was a horrible day. You know, like I'm not going to do that again. And I go back to my same, you know, routine, but on the, on the general, you know, I, I check myself, you know, from a checks and balances perspective, and I'm really happy with where we're going. And just, I'm getting big and I love it. I just want to get bigger. I just want to get bigger and faster as much as I can, you know, like just keep growing these muscles, you know, it's too slow, too slow. I think the, the, I think the coolest thing about what you're doing is you've been 240 pounds before and looked yeah. entirely differently. So you have a, you have a direct like, okay, that's what 240 pounds look like. It definitely is infinitely better now. So you have that sort yeah. of comparison and I think you can sort of, okay, right. You say I'm getting weight again, but it's a completely different body composition overall. And I think I did, I brought up the two shit, your very first photo and the photo from this week. Like, I mean, it's fucking, it's night and day. It's night oh and yeah. Day. Well, it's funny because I, I saw my, um, saw Gavin's uh, old coach from basketball. We were at a tournament uh, this last weekend and I was coaching Mason's team for the tournament. We did really well in the tournament. I was so proud of the kids. Uh, it did so well. Um, just a lot of progress and working together as a team. And it's funny because, like, not to get derailed with the conversation, but, like, I've been trying we to always teach these get derailed with the know, conversation. But I've been, I've been trying to teach these kids for the longest time, you know, how to play basketball, right? And, and that's a really tough thing to teach because – it's about understanding the court. It's about understanding where people are. It's understanding spacing. It's understanding how to get open and take good shots. You know, you look at Steph Curry, and, and no one on my team is a Steph Curry. No one in, in my league is a Steph Curry. 
So you shouldn't be sitting there dropping threes all the time from a basketball perspective, but yet they want to drop that three, right? Because it's three points versus two points and all this other stuff. But your shot percentages are so low. And I, we track all the stats. We're like, listen, you, you folks are like literally at like a 15% shooting percentage here. Like we're throwing away so many points here, but you can't, te- you know, it's hard to teach those, those dynamics, but it's funny because, you know, a lot of coaches will use like certain plays where, you know, we have one play called ball state, which is basically just a screening play where, you know, you set up a screen, you kick back out really quick for a quick mid range shot. If you don't have that shot, you drive to the hoop. If not, you pass it out. Okay. So they'll run that, that play fall to see, but they, they only run that play. They don't like, if something changes in that play, like a person's in a different position or something else, they still run that play. They're not playing basketball. Right. So I taught them a play this week, uh, this last week. And I, I put a play in air quotes because they basically, I taught them basketball, which is, this play is called Rocket, and all you do is the, the, the point guard drives in as fast as he can. If he, if he can go past and, and blow past his defender, go up for a layup, great. If not, kick the ball back out. The next person attacks the paint, kicks it back out. Literally, that's basketball. And, and so, like, but, but they, they, in their head, it's a play. So, like, we ran this this weekend, and we just destroyed teams because they actually played basketball. In their head, it's a play, but it's really just teaching a basketball. So, it was really cool to see. You know, I finally found something that resonated with them that they could actually use, um, you know, for the rest of their holy basketball careers to to actually play <laughs> basketball versus like, hey, setting this motion or this or whatever. So it's been a lot of fun. But anyways, the story. No, I'm something... going to go full down the D-wheel. I'm going to go full down the D-wheel basketball conversation here. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, no, this, this, is, this, is, this is not the last. Oh, God. You got it. Go ahead. So the guy that coached Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, Tim Grover, I think his name is. He did a podcast with Stephen Bartlett, the Diary of a CEO, po- the Diary of a CEO podcast that I was into. Yeah. I read. I don't know if you've read his book, Relentless. It's an incredible book. Anybody who hasn't, I would recommend reading it. But he goes into great detail about the, you know, we talk about the 1% wins and gaining that like not push out one advantage. And he says, that's where great people, businesses, basketball players are made. And he talks about times of him arriving early, literally walking up and down the court with Michael Jordan or with Kobe and finding the bits on the court where the ball doesn't bounce as well so that he knew either <laughs> where to drive the other players in or where to avoid. And it's like those details is what yeah. makes players. And I was like, like, what, like, at what level do you have to really start thinking about those? And he says, like, you know, just the stuff that he was talking about, I would highly recommend this in the podcast. That's awesome. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, I mean, whatever advantage you could take, you know, to give you that 1%, right, is... Mm-hmm is definitely what those those athletes will do in every capacity, whether that's, you know, mental or physical understanding the game. I mean, you look at LeBron, he understands the whole, he can sit there in his mind and replay the entire game, pass for pass, who passed, who did what, who did where, what happened, conversion. I mean, like, he knows every single thing that's happening on the court. It's just crazy. But the, 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 before we get into the actual discussion, we're supposed to be on the podcast, um, the, one of the coaches came out to me and he was like, he's like, Dave, oh my God. And, and, and it's not even um, a question anymore. It's not like, hey, are you lifting now? It's, oh my God, Dave, like you look jacked, dude. Oh, holy smokes. He's like that. Dave today would have just totally like beat the living crap out of the old Dave that he saw on the streets. Like I, that's insane. I can't believe how big you are. I'm like, thanks, man. You know, and he's a, he's a weightlifter, you know, he's a more of like a fit, you know, guy, you know, muscular type of build, but never really went big or anything like that. Just more of like a, a lean muscle mass um, type of guy. And, um, and he's just like, you look, look great, dude. Oh my God. And so it was cool to get, you know, that, but I had like four other people mention the same thing. You know, I had one guy sit down I had seen in the year. He's like, dude, holy crap, you balked up. I'm like, yeah, yeah. So it's not even a question anymore. People recognize, which is like a really cool thing. It's like, are you, hey, you look, you look, you look like you're fit. No, you look like you, you got a lot of muscle. I'm like, yeah. So that's what I want. So. Yeah, I fucking did. It's like, yeah, hey, I had, I had previous days. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I should have just said, nah, I, I lift every so often. So, you know, it's a, <laughs> a casual yeah, rec- record. <laughs> but I think it's it's good to, to get that recognition and you know what I mean like it's good to get that feedback and as we always joke about like you know we do it to be recognized by other guys that lift like oh yeah you, you know you obviously lift like I'm I'm here for it all day long yeah so anyway let's, let's talk <laughs> let's talk about body optimization 20, 28 <laughs> minutes later <laughs> let's talk about what we're talking about yeah, body optimization. Uh, I, I recently listened to uh, the Huberman Labs podcast. Oh my god! Can um, I just say, actually, can yeah, I just say ahead. a note on that? Obviously, his podcast with Jocko is five hours long, which is a commitment. I don't know if like it is a commitment. However, I have an entirely different view on Andrew Huberman now after listening to that. His like where he came from, his origin story is very cool. So, if anybody has five hours of their life that they want to spend listening to them too, I would highly recommend. 
I need to listen to it. Is it on Jocko's podcast or is it on? Yeah, it's Jocko. Okay. It's Jocko. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So he's he's interviewing, but it's obviously they talk about loads of stuff. But you know, they yeah. talk about like where he came from and his whole story, which I didn't know anything about. So very cool. Highly recommend. That's two podcasts. I'll link them in the thing. Dude, some about. of the ones he's been coming out with lately are like three and a half, four hours, but they're so good. It's like a master class in like muscle hypertrophy or like body optimization. I, I learn so much every time, and it's just like like little tiny tidbits that make big things like the one thing that that Huberman explained on his muscle hypertrophy one that I talked about previously on the podcast is after I get done lifting now I listen to some relaxing like spa music and I lay on my back and just breathe for five minutes and that yeah. tells your body that um you know you're done doing whatever crazy shit you were just put yourself through you need to chill out and relax <laughs> and, and and it it allows your body to basically recover and to get better um, energy production throughout the day because I was finding myself crashing halfway out through the day after after a workout. So, like, that was, like, game changer for me because I couldn't figure out why at 2 o'clock did I need to take a nap. I don't need to take naps anymore. I don't get tired anymore, you know, throughout the day just for that one simple life hack. But those little tidbits there or even, like, the muscle hypertrophy stuff around muscle endurance versus growth and getting into the science of that and how mTOR production works within your, in your cells, um, you know, everybody thinks it's just – you know, it's it's just uh, muscle tearing you know, your muscle fibers. That's a component of it. But there's also, you know, even if you don't tear muscle or hurt your muscle in any way, shape, or form, if you're lifting muscle into muscle fatigue, you know, your body's sending signals to produce uh, more muscle through the, uh, you know, through through your body. So it's it's just cool to hear all these these breakdowns. But the most recent one um, that I listened to as I was um, going through uh, my my steps uh, it actually took two uh, full uh, different days to listen to the whole podcast because I think it was like three and a half hours. Uh, but it was with uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. And, you know, they had gotten into, um, you know, body longevity, longevity of health. Um, they had gotten into why we're in such a dire state today from a health perspective um, and why things aren't good for us moving forward. And it was interesting to hear um, her perspective of things. You know, at, at the end of the day, we evolved, you know, through various types of constraints, you know, uh, and, and we, we are cavemen to, you know, dinosaur days all the way to where we're at today. And you have different versions of our, ourselves from Neanderthals and, you know, uh, different types of, of creatures that we, we spawn from. Uh, and those all created who we are today and, and how we've kind of evolved throughout the evolutionary period. And what Dr. Rondo kind of put in perspective was, you know, how we forge for food and how we, lived back then is very different than how we live now. And our bodies really haven't caught up to that type of adaptation. And so, you know, a lot of our genes and how they actually work in our DNA are um, you, you have to do certain things for them to be activated. Uh, so for example, uh, cold water plunging, right? Well, you know, that, that activates very specific stress response pathways in our body that allow us to do certain things. Same thing for heat. It, it activates stress response pathways that allow us to, you know, recover faster or for blood flow or for, you know, calorie burn or things that affect because our body temperature increasing increases a lot of things in our, in our, our body. And so it's just really interesting to see how, you know, uh, we put ourselves through. And there's this concept called hermesis, which is basically, you know, she explained it to what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So when we put our body under strain or stress, our body reacts by trying to strengthen ourselves in all of those different areas, whether that's our immune system, whether that's muscle growth and why we're able to put on muscle so we can be stronger, uh, whether that's for brain development activity in order for us to hunt better or faster, uh, those those stress response uh, pathways and putting ourselves through, hermes uh, through her her hermesis allows us to continuously become stronger um, as an individual. So, you know, we, we have reduced a lot of that by our sedentary lifestyles, by not getting out there and running and putting ourselves through stress and not activating a lot of our neural pathways or our um, uh, pathways that allow us to um, build those types of, of capabilities in our bodies. And it's, it's obviously decreasing our health in many facets because we don't activate those things that traditionally regulate our body, regulate DNA repair, regulate, you know, uh, our immune systems, all of those different things out there. So it was, it was interesting for her to break that down. And then she talks about, um, some of the things that I thought was really interesting uh, around, and, and, and it's, not a, it's not a supplement thing. It's just more so like how vitamin D impacts the body and how omega-3 fatty acids, uh, acids create longevity of health um, and some other areas here that I thought was really cool. But, I mean, it's just so fascinating to hear 
you know, the doctor goes through the science of our bodies and how we have to put ourselves through stress and how our bodies enjoy stress and how our bodies react to stress uh, and how our bodies need stress in order for us to live longer. Yeah, I think <laughs> we're probably at a stage now, like humanity itself, that we can live longer than we have ever lived. But the way I look at it is like, what do we need to do there in terms of like, you know, healthcare, or, you know, medicine, whatever to actually get there, but also like the quality of, of life that we have is not what it potentially used to be in terms of feeling fulfilled and whatever else. And I think it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a double edged sword because yes, okay. You know, we can live longer and whatever else, but in terms of like our health and the quality of things that we can do, like we're probably making that worse due to, you know, how accessible food is, how I'm going to say how lazy people can be. Um, and you know, the, this the general way that people live their lives it's not as fulfilling or they're not doing things that you know they actually enjoy they're like mindlessly scrolling on social media to get dopamine dopamine hit rather than you know actually enjoying the quality of life well and he, uh, he, uh human actually brought down you know dopamine hits are a ph phenomenal thing it's a reward system for us right but dopamine hits without actually doing something is not a good thing yeah yeah so if yeah. you know if you're doing cocaine obviously that's a massive rush of dopamine that's not good for you, right? The things that we're doing on social media and the, the devices that are, are entrancing us for dopamine hits, those aren't good things for our bodies. You know, going out and running for that dopamine uh, rush or going out for, you know, doing exercise for that dopamine rush, you know, those are rewarding things that our body uses in order to create a positive view of things uh, and what we're doing. And, you know, so it was really interesting to hear like, you know, like, hey, dopamine's not a bad thing but it is abused very much so in our modern society. Uh, and we're rewarded for things that don't require any type of effort or for us to go through hermesis or to put ourselves through any of these uh, stress response pathways. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that I think, you know, when we start looking at how do we optimize our body, we have to put it through stress, right? Whether, you know, and that's our immune system, that's our overall health. And one of the areas that she started covering was uh, around vitamin D3, um, and how 70% of the U.S. is inadequate in vitamin D. Now, obviously, in the U.K., I'm sure it's probably very similar. Um, places that don't have a lot of light. Worse. I would say it's probably, I don't we know. get sun over here. We do not get sun over here. Like, it's, it does not. Happen. Yeah, but no one in the U.S. goes outside. So it's like, you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the sun's there. But yeah. <laughs> They're all sitting in their chairs and watching TV and social media. But, uh, um, you know, that was me. Um, but, uh, you know, and obviously, I'm <laughs> speaking from experience. Listen, I can't, I can't get vitamin D because I go outside and I burn instantly. Okay, we've we've, we've discussed this on the podcast. Listen, the sun and me just not are not friends. We're never going to be friends. Um, you know, it's not in my gene pool. But uh, you know, but like they they talk about specifically African Americans who you know are used to getting a large amount of sun exposure, and it's about a you know I think it was like a something like a forty percent reduction in UV rays that African Americans receive due to their skin color, which is you know an evolutionary trait. Uh, from that side because they're in the sun so much. And, you know, uh, when they come to the United States where there is a, a general lack of that type of sun, especially from, from Africa, um, there's a massive amount of, of vitamin D deficiencies. And what I, what I didn't understand about uh, vitamin D is that it's actually not really a vitamin. It's actually a steroidal hormone. Uh, vitamin D directly creates steroidal hormones in our body that regulate over 5% of our DNA regulates over 5% of our DNA it is literally the single largest activation of our DNA structure from a single source than any other thing out there. So you can imagine that is extremely important uh, for our bodies. <laughs> That's something that you want <laughs> to get enough of. Yeah. It regulates more than 5% of our genome. Like, like literally that's something you want to have in your body. Um, yeah. And so everything from your bones uh, to immune systems, blood pressure, water retention, and, you know, it, it hits almost every aspect of our bodies. And yet we're, you know, over 70% of the U.S. is deficient in it. I mean, it controls mood and happiness. You name it. There's a laundry list of things that vitamin D do, uh, vitamin D does. So, you know, I'd heavily recommend, uh, you know, if you're not into supplementation, totally fine. One thing I would heavily recommend is just, just, well, I'd recommend two things. Um, one thing is, is vitamin D for sure. Um, because it's such an important thing. Uh, the doctor explained, um, anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 I use, obviously, you know, the, the general disclaimer, go talk to your doctor before you do any of this stuff, yada, yada, yada. Um, we're but, not doctors, uh, we're not cetera, doctors. uh, but Dr. Rhonda Patrick is, uh, you know, so I'm clearly quoting her. 
um, you know, uh, Huberman does upwards to the 15,000 to 20,000 mark saying really, you, you can't really get too much vitamin D. So I, I pound it because it's one of the most important, um, you know, vitamins that you can possibly do. Um, and so, uh, there's a great blend. It's, uh, uh, I, I use the thorn, uh, one, uh, that's actually recommended through Huberman. So, um, it's a D3 slash, uh, D3, which has K2 in it as well. So it has better absorption through your tongue. Um, and it's just Is a dropper. Spray? No, just oh, yeah, I've, yeah, I've yeah. used it. I've used the spray before, and I think it, it, it's quite cool. I obviously used the the blue nutrition one, but um, yeah, the even you talking about you know, mood and stuff like that. Like you find people whenever it starts to come in to winter that they just generally feel less good, and there's more you know depression and whatever else. And it is you know it's, it's seasonal affective disorder. I think it is, and people yeah. just think, oh, you know what's going on with me? I just feel dying, and it's like well because you've just taken away the vitamin D and that's, you know, that's literally what it is. And it's crazy the impact that that has, but also the people can't correlate the two things. Yep. Yeah. So, so I'm going to up my dose yeah. to 15,000 I use. That's what I'm doing. So start I'm, I'm taking do- it all the time. I'm, I'm doing 15,010 now just to, just to beat you, but, uh, uh, I'm going li- to line it up and sniff it. <laughs> yeah, sniff it do not recommend. D. I'm not going to do that. Anybody. Who's like, oh, that maybe <laughs> yeah. No, uh, no, vitamin D, again, staple one. Uh, one of the other ones that she had brought up, and this was actually her number one. So that was her number two. Her number one was omega-3 fatty acids. And um, and I guess, you know, I understood omega-3 fatty acids were important, but I didn't understand how important they were. So interesting enough, Japan has the largest population of longevity of life. Their, their, their overall age of, of when they die is the highest in the one of the highest in the world. And they've directly linked that to the amount of fish as part of their diet that they eat, which directly equates to omega-3 fatty acids. And there were some some interesting studies that came out around omega-3 fatty acids, specifically around um, EPA. EPA is one of the most important. DHA is more on the brain activity side. EPA is more of the overall regulatory for your body health. And um, so if you have a – so here's a stat here. Um, studies show that a higher, higher omega-3 fatty acid index, which means you're taking you know supplemental – uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids creates a case for longevity of life. There's direct correlation to that via various, uh, very, uh, through multiple studies. Now, a higher omega uh, index equals higher lifespan. A low omega-3 is a five-year lower life expectancy. Holy shit. Five years lower from a low amount of omega-3 fatty acids. Now, I think that's, that's why, you know, obviously whenever we recommend supplements, we have like, these are what I would recommend to everyone. It's not, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to push supplements. I'm not selling multivitamins in case that Viking guy's fucking cracking up. But the, <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, we would say vitamin D3 and omega-3, like everybody should take them. It's not, you know, it's not a case of like we're doing that to, you know, from performance or whatever. It's like no matter who you are on the planet, you should probably look at taking these in some way. Yeah. And, and to back it up even more, listen to this crazy uh, stat. So smokers with no omega-3 fatty acids obviously have a low life expectancy, right? You're cutting off life, high cancer risk. You know, the list goes on. It's just horrible for you in every way. However, smokers with a high uh, omega index, so smokers that that take omega-3 fatty acid uh, supplementation have the same life expectancy as non-smokers with low omega. Holy shit. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) Yeah, I was like, yeah. when I lost it, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like walking in my trail. I'm like, I stop. I'm like, wow, that's like powerful <laughs> as hell right there. It's like literally, if you're not taking omega three fatty acids, your life expectancy is the same as a uh, smoker that's taking omega three fatty acids. I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah, I, I just yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, so the the general recommended dosha, dosage um, for omega three fatty acids is around two grams. Um, or so, so 2000 milligrams or two grams of, um, fish oils per day, a uh, thousand being EPA thousand making up, um, others like DHA and, and those types of ones. So, um, thousand, uh, 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 um, EPA is being the most important, uh, with that. So I actually upped my omega three fatty acids. I have the total, um, the on it total human ones. And I think there's only, I want to say there's only a thousand, uh, milligrams of, uh, omega threes in there only 500 consist of e, uh, EPA. So I actually upped my dosage of omega three fatty acids starting a couple of days ago. Um, so heavily recommend uh, as staple supplements. Again, you know we're not pushing supplements here, um, but I'd recommend um, doing omega three fatty acids and vitamin D three with K two um, as as being the the big one there. So 
So my, I use the Blue Nutrition one, obviously I've just pulled it up here. Each 1000 milligram soft gel contains EPA 500 milligrams, DHA 250 milligrams. And I'm 99% sure I take six of those a day. So two in, <laughs> or three, three in the morning, three in the evening. I should be covered, right? It should be good. Yeah. I'm going to live. I'm going to live the 100, right? I eat a lot of sushi. That's it. Guaranteed now. Guaranteed now. Yeah. It's just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy though. Like, I mean, and, 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 and it makes sense um, because... Again, we've talked about the whole dieting aspects of things, but but traditionally, based on de- different geographic regions, our bodies have evolved in different ways. So that's why some of us respond better to uh, higher fat, higher proteins based on our genetics. That's why some of us, uh, you know, respond better to higher carbohydrates and higher protein uh, as a a more balanced diet. Mo- no diets really consisted of all three heavily, right? Um, based on the geographic regions that you're at. So. You know, if you're, you know, more inland, you di- typically didn't have access to fish and those types of things. So you hunted more red meats and you typically had agriculture. So probably wheats and things of that affect carbohydrates that allows you to to burn for energy. Whereas, you know, if you're primarily living in the ocean, you know, fish, high protein, high fats, um, you know, seafood, that type of stuff is going to be primarily your diet. And, um, you know, from omega-3 fatty acids, it's just the, the breakdown of that was just really crazy because, um, you know, what... They're, they're correlating a lot of the data now around why fatty acids have such a huge uh, impact on there. And there's a lot of research coming out now around your, your gut biome and how that um, equates to your overall age, lifestyle, long, longevity of life. Um, your gut is a, a major, major uh, portion of that. And so when you're eating shit like alcohol or just eating you know, high-calorie sugars and things that affect your gut, basically... Uh, releases endotoxins into your body, um, which is not good. Obviously, increases um, uh, inflammation, also causes depression, uh, a lot of other things. It's it's really bad for your body with these endotoxins being released to your gut. And uh, studies show that basically having um, EPAs um, in your body, the omega three fatty acids, really reduces the damage of those and actually recovers, you know, regenerates your body from that period uh, period from those endotoxins being released in your body. So it's it's such a huge staple supplement that it's like, you know, she even said, if you can only pick one thing, you know, to do the rest of your life, fish oils are those things that you, you absolutely have to create as part of your daily routine. And then she said, second would be vitamin D, uh, D3 as being, being, being that as well. She also brought up, um, one last one that I wanted to, to hit on, which I w- actually wasn't aware of. Um, and this one was kind of mind blowing, uh, to me as well, which of course I bought it and I'm now eating, uh, using those as supplements, but, um, but Brock, what's that <laughs> something I need? <laughs> I actually texted you as I learned about it. I'm like, you need to order this now. So um, I think I'm not, I mean, full disclosure, I think whenever you text me, I was a little bit drunk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Carl. Yeah, yeah, Car- yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the, the third one she had mentioned, which I didn't realize there was a lot of science behind this, was uh, broccoli sprout extract. Mm. And, um, and she's leading a lot of the, the leading studies on broccoli sprout extracts because there's a lot of great data coming out uh, now around um, sulforaphanes. Uh, which is basically a, a chemical that is used in broccoli sprouts. And what sulfur fanes do um, is it enables what are called NRF, uh, NRF2 pathways, uh, and it actually bypasses what's called the blood-brain barrier. So, um, you know, uh, we've talked about glutathione before, um, how it's a powerful antioxidant that your body produces um, to be an antioxidant, but uh, glutathione supplementation only directly hits your bloodstreams. It doesn't ever go to your brain. And with uh, broccoli sprout extracts, it actually bypasses the blood-brain barrier and, and, and shows increased production of glutathione in your brain, uh, which helps with you know brain uh, activity. In fact, they're looking at it right now from a research perspective. It's showing great promise around helping with autism. Uh, so from a brain activity perspective, um, but the most important piece um, of sulforaphates is that um, just by taking sulforaphates in human, and this is uh, both animal and human trial studies, uh, human studies. Um, shows that by taking sulforaphates with it, uh, for 48 hours had a um, DNA repair percentage of 24 to 34%. So it repaired your DNA damage between 24 and 34% uh, within a 48 hour period, which is huge, right? So, you know, obviously DNA repair being a direct causation of, of age, longevity, you know, cancer, things to that effect. Being able to repair that in your body is a massive, massive piece. And it also helps the glutathione development, which is a powerful antioxidant, which cleans out all the toxins in your body. Um, so it's basically broccoli sprout extract, uh, which is, um, 
you know, like, like things like um, benzene, for example, which is really bad in our body. Uh, we're absorbing a, a, a massive amount of benzene through various things. Um, it helps clear that out, helps, you know, uh, recover from bla- uh, uh, bad damage DNA from, from day-to-day activities in our life and, and our, our conditions that we have here. So um, that was a really cool one. Um, helps with liver and lungs um, and helps with the, the blood activity. I'm sorry, brain activity um, pieces and regenerative uh, functions with cognitive uh, functionality. So it's just really cool. Like I didn't know about that one. I started taking that. And it was like crazy because as soon as I started taking it, like I, I benched 700 pounds more uh, than I did before. So it was, it was nuts. I think, <laughs> I think the, the sort of piece to take from that is, and I've said this before, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that I'm speaking to coming on discovery calls and vision calls, they, they want better cognitive function. They want to ditch the brain fog. They want to be able to think better, work better, feel better. Like they want to sort of be in control of their mind. So things like that are things that you can sort of start to incorporate. And I guess, okay, while well, I get, you know, there is a supplement for whatever else. I have never seen it like in a store over here, but I'm 99% sure you could actually get broccoli sprout in a store over there, like yeah. whether it's Whole Foods or something like that. You could actually get it and just eat it directly with it on the base supplement. And she did warn um, that cooking broccoli sprout is uh, the um, the uh, sulforaphane in, in the uh, broccoli is, is heat sensitive. So if you do cook, it will remove some of the sulforaphane from it. Um, so typically raw is the better function from from broccoli sprouts if you can manage that so some dipping sauce or something like that would be great um but i think if you just throw it like if you just throw it onto a salad or something yeah like it's literally like it's like it looks like watercress or something yeah that's good yeah and the the last um the last one to, to talk about that she had mentioned was magnesium uh which we've talked about before in the past magnesium has been a staple supplement for me uh for the longest time so as omega-3s by the way and vitamin d the only one i, I recently added was was the broccoli sprout um extract but um, magnesium comes in multiple different forms. You have uh, magnesium citrate, threonate, and malate are the kind of the three main ones. Um, and uh, citrate is good if you want to poop, basically. So, um, but uh, threonate and malate are probably the two best options. Uh, and I like a blend of that. So malate is going to be the best that your body can convert from an ATP production perspective, so energy production perspective. Magnesium is like your staple... Uh, you know, uh, mineral in your body that your body uses for energy production and everything else. I mean, it's huge. It's, it's, it's how our brain waves work and everything else inside of our, our brain. Um, it's, it's massive. It, it helps repair DNA. Um, it helps release enzymes in our body. So magnesium is a very much a staple. And a lot of us are magnesium deficient. So I use, um, it, there's a magnesium blend that I use, which is a half malate, half, uh, three, uh, three and eight. And I take that at night, uh, before I go to bed. So, um, basically, you know, if you're looking at supplementation, um, you know, these are the probably the four things that I or the three things that I would recommend on top of like creatine, you know, something like that. So, so those would be the four things uh, omega 3 fatty acids, vitamin D3, <laughs> magnesium, uh, three and eight or malate, and then broccoli sprouts, and then and then creatine, right? Okay, well, I mean, I think we specifically said at some point we didn't want to turn this into a supplement conversation. Know, I know, I know, I know. So, it was just cool. other things, other uh, yeah, it's very cool, like 100%. And what I would say is like. Obviously, you know, if you don't want to just start taking it based on what we say, which is absolutely fair enough, yeah, you know, go and get tested to see what you're deficient in, see how much of each thing you need to take to bring you up to optimal levels. Like, go based on what your blood work say. Like, go based on the science behind that, and you know, dose it correctly and everything else. Um, I think there's probably a lot to be said for you know, whenever we have the conversation about what we're going to talk about today, we want the body optimization, brain optimization, stuff like that. There's so many things that you can do as well as that that aren't supplementation so even you know we've talked about you know whole foods and eating whole foods like even the the feeling better factor from that alone is you know it's it's massive in terms of like processed foods like and it literally comes down to and i don't know if you're the same now but whenever you eat something that's like quote unquote junk food or whatever else or highly processed you feel like shit the next day or straight away and it's like is this fucking worth it and there's you know obviously people eat highly processed food all the time, they eat takeaway food all the time, and they feel shit all the time. But because they haven't had the, oh my God, I feel good because I'm eating good whole source foods, they don't have a comparison. They just feel like they feel shit all the time and that's just the way it is. So I think yeah. if you start with that, I think that's probably a good a good place to go. Did you watch the, the not to bring them up because it's not science in any way and it's more entertainment, the Liver King oh, guy? I haven't seen it yet. I, I got the link and I added Fuck it to my playlist. But in hell. Is he crazy? That guy, he... Is I respect him because he's incredibly passionate about the message that he's delivering. But I mean, 
am I going to start eating bull's testicles? Probably not. <laughs> but he did make a good point, and I actually would like to sort of delve a bit deeper into this. I mean, have you ever shit. eaten bull's te- bull's testicles before? No. Then how do yet. you know? How do you know before you did dig on it, man? I mean, it's... I've never, I've never had it, but I mean, you never know. <laughs> Okay, so, well, so next time, time I come over, next time we come over, we'll, we're gonna find a bull's testicle place to get to go eat some bulls, bull testicles. <laughs> so he did, he did make a good point. That's, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't know, I haven't researched it, so don't quote me on it. But he said that you know, ancestrally, if you had somebody within the tribe who had a weak heart, you would feed them the heart of a strong animal to help with that because they didn't have medication, they didn't have yeah. a lot of shit. So. Like it makes a lot of sense if you had someone who had you know a weak liver or a problem with their liver, you feed them the liver of a strong animal, and obviously the stronger the animal, the better, and whatever else. So, I mean, it makes sense. However, I mean, I like to cook my foods. I like to eat the muscle meat and not the the actual internal organs. It's the it's the idea yeah. of it, and I'm ninety nine percent sure that my problem with it becomes from being around my nana's house and her eating liver all the time. I was just like, this is not, this is not for me. But anyway, he eats it with salt and maple syrup and just lifts it like, and he's jacked AF. I mean, so uh, it's interesting, you know, there, you know, Aubrey Marcus, you know, made the statement, you are what you eat ate, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and there's something we said about if you're eating animals that are well fed, that, um, you know, are, are natural in, in nature, they're not, you know, produced with, you know, steroids or antibiotics or things of that effect, uh, you know, they're getting good food as they go through. And as you eat that, obviously, you know, their body is being replenished from what they eat. We eat that, you know, our body is being replenished from what they ate. Um, so there's something to be said about the quality of food that you eat and the type of food that you eat. I mean, I, I don't know the science behind if you eat a strong animal, does that make you strong in nature? You know, but, um, you know, it makes sense theory, to me. In, well, it's, it's, you know, it, why do we prefer quality meats? You know, I mean, I mean, you can taste the difference by from, from, you know, a good filet versus a filet that's been flash frozen or that isn't fresh or, you know, comes from, you know, mass produced, you know, uh, uh, a far, you know, farm place. So, you know, it, it makes sense. Our taste buds are wired that way. We want, you know, higher quality meat, um, you know, that we go and hunt for, we forage for, uh, that's in nature, that type of stuff. Again, that's how we were kind of brought through, but it, it makes sense. I mean, from a, you know, again, non-scientific, you know, the liver guy uh, perspective. So, you know, the liver king or whatever. I think, I think <laughs> by the I, way, I, I'll tell you one thing really quick though. The thing, the one thing in life that you will never see me eat is liver. I hate liver. I hate it. I can't stand the smell. But of you're it. okay. You're okay to eat a bull's testicle. I'll do a bull's testicle all day long. Right? Liver. Nope. You got me. Not going to do it. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I said, I think he's very passionate about it. And I do sort of see it as a bit of, did some marketing company sort of take this guy on and create this brand around liver King. And you know, there's night endless amounts of supplements that he's trying to push and whatever else, but it's, it's entertainment value. I'm not saying that you need to go and everybody needs to start eating raw liver and bone marrow and whatever the fuck else he eats. Um, but it's definitely worth checking out. And there's a lot of people that I don't agree with, but I respect them because they really believe or they're really passionate about the message that you're sending. And he's one of those guys. He is entertainment. And like I said, he is fucking huge. <laughs> yeah. And well, there was, I think it was a huge debate on like, you know, he says he doesn't use steroids or anything like that. And, and uh, yeah. everybody's like, he doesn't use, you know, and, and, I don't know, I think it was... Uh, I mean, he's play- eating Bill's testicles, surely. There's a lot of testosterone in, in that alone. <laughs> so the more... He actually, more- one, of the, one of the podcasts that he was on that I was listening to, he was like, I don't understand why people eat vegetables. Why would you eat vegetables when you could eat testicles? I was like, is that a fucking <laughs> catchphrase? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I can't say I'd be bragging about that. I'd be you know, like, hey, man, you know, I, I had this awesome, you know, uh, meal that the center highlight of it was Bull's testicles, and uh, he... <laughs> You know, like cutting them up and uh, it just doesn't seem good to me. I don't know. Like I said, I'd be willing to try it, but uh, probably it's probably a one-time thing. I tried escargot once and I was like, yep, I'm good. I don't I need to imagine that's the same. It's different. Well, I mean, it's got to be similar texture, I would assume, right? I mean, like, ugh, ugh, slimy or whatever. Anyway, uh, sorry for everybody listening to us about bull's testicles uh, on this podcast. But I mean, but again, you know, um, I think, you know, back at the end of the day, you're eat, you know, when we break down the food, when we break down what it's made of, at the end of the day, it's vitamins, it's minerals, it's, it's you know, our macro breakdowns for pr- protein, carbohydrates, and fats. And at the end of the day, if that's good source food, our body can replenish ourselves with good source stuff as well. So I think that's probably the gist of that, right? You know, from a, from a <laughs> wrapped up in a perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely recommend, though, look, look at the quality of your foods. And I think there, there was obviously a big movement within the industry of if it fits your macros, where everybody was eating Pop-Tarts and Skittles for every meal. 
which I understand to an extent, but I think it fucked up a lot of people who yeah. went the total opposite way. And I think if you can find a balance of having that 20% of the time, but 80% of the time, like we always say, eat whole foods that actually make you feel good. Like, I don't know about you, you know, I know you don't like avocados, but if I eat an avocado in the day, like I feel fucking good. Like the, you actually, you, there is a feel good factor of eating yeah. avocado because of the serotonin and stuff in it. So, you know, if you can find good quality foods that are single sourced, unprocessed, that will literally fuel your body in a good way. They're good in terms of how your body digests them. It's not a struggle. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense. I just had for lunch, I had uh, chicken, rice, and broccoli with some sriracha. And it's like my, that's my favorite meal, by the way. I, yeah. I literally could just eat that all day long. I love yeah. chicken, rice, and broccoli. Um, yeah. But I, I feel good afterwards. I got high energy levels. I feel, you know, fantastic. I feel full. Um, yeah, I don't want to go eat a Pop Tart. Um, now I kind of want to eat a Pop Tart. Now we're talking about it. But, um, but uh, you know, it's one of the, you know, I, I will eat Pop Tarts from time to time. If like I'm really hurting for carbs and I need something quick. Um, it's not the greatest, but you know, I'm, you know, maybe once a month or something like that, I'll pop a, I'll pop a pop tart. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting. But I, again, you know, how you eat the food, what you put in your body, and you had mentioned, you know, when we start talking about the supplements, get micronutrient testing. One of the things that I um, that I use, it's actually right here, uh, is Inside Tracker, uh, and and they're not sponsored or affiliated with them in any way, shape, or form. Um, not yet. I'm going to send them an email right now. <laughs> um, but Inside Tracker, uh, they will schedule a local uh, uh, lab that's by you, like LabCorp, things like that. They'll go and draw your blood. You get all the results on their on their app. You have, there's an app, and it'll tell you both from a, a micronutrient testing perspective, and they even do uh, DNA testing. In fact, the box that I have here is uh, my DNA testing to see, you know, what am I, you know, from a uh, like. Am I more susceptible to certain things or, you know, that type of stuff through a DNA uh, stru uh, structure perspective? So um, it's really neat. Um, I really like them. I get my blood work done through them every uh, six months. I also do regular testing through my doctor um, just to make sure my levels are all good in that fast. And, and, you know, blood work is probably one of the most important things you could possibly do. So getting into a regular cycle of that is, is, is awesome. And I think even if it's, you know, you don't want to get covered by insurance, you can, you can literally go to a lab corp, you know, find your nearest location. Um, and I think it's like 30 or 40 bucks. Uh, to get your your full breakdown of your blood work done, so you know getting that done regularly is is probably the most important thing. And then the micronutrient testing, I found um, because of my prior surgery, uh, I was deficient in iron, so I had to take iron supplements to really bounce that up. And so balancing out your body, how you feel, and, and just giving you an understanding where you're at. Obviously, testosterone levels are an important one for men. Estrogen levels for women, um, you know, the, the list goes on. You know, thyroid functionality, um, you know. Uh, glutenizing hormones, all those things are, are super important to understand, you know, how your body's actually operating and working. Yeah, I think the, the biggest take home that I always say is, <clears throat> number one, it's good to have the data. And number two, don't just accept things for what they are. Try and work out why you feel a certain way. If you feel like shit, there is inevitably going to be a reason why you feel like shit. So get your blood work tested, get your micronutrient tested, look at your foods. Is there a specific thing that you eat and then feel like shit after? Like, don't just accept things for the way they are because they've always been that way. It doesn't always have to be that way. Yeah. The, the last thing I want to hit on, because I think we got about five more minutes left, um, is that the last thing that she hit on was both cold water and uh, sauna use. And I'll hit on the, the sauna use because cold water is stupid. Um, but uh, <laughs> now there's actually a lot of benefits of, of cold water. <laughs> um, <laughs> But <laughs> just every, cold every, water is stupid. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it so much. Um, but the the sauna thing I thought was really interesting. Um, there's some some long term studies, short term studies, mid term studies, and uh, a lot of it's coming out of Finland because in Finland uh, saunas are like second nature to everybody. Everybody uses saunas in Finland, um, and so they have the most data research, and it's predominantly men. Um, and so I would imagine they have cold water there too. No, nah, I think they got rid of that. They banned it just because it was so bad. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm not obviously cold water is, is a good thing. Um, but uh, for for men, what they found um, based off of longevity studies is that, and this is a men only study. Unfortunately, they don't know the impact yet of women, but it's looking to be you know fairly similar in nature from the new studies that are coming out. So you know, again, uh, it's predominantly men driven because men in Finland, you know, going to showers and sitting and all that other stuff that goes out there, um, it's part of that whole kind of culture thing that that that, that they do. Um, so they had the, the most amount of data sets there, and what they found was that if you use the sauna uh, four to seven times a week, so f four being the bare minimum, seven being you know essentially the max that they tested for. Um, and, and when they say that, it's it's roughly around 150 degrees or above and for 20 minutes or more. Okay, so that's kind of the, the entry point for the data that they, they used. They found that your um, your cardiovascular mortality rate dropped by 50%. 
cardiovascular mortality rate drops by 50 50 percent 50 five zero percent that Holy is shit woo, right now, hang on it gets crazier if you do four to seven times a week your sudden death cardiovascular uh chances drops over 60 well over 60 percent it's like 67 percent um just by doing four or seven times a week so massive massive man massive benefits from a cardiovascular perspective but also you know they're looking at um it has immune system uh, um you know boosting properties uh, uh toxicity you know removing toxins from your body um you know um human growth hormone uh production there's th that one's a bit um shady because like you literally have to like the way that they tested that is you had to be in like the they they they, they basically had you go in a sauna for 30 minutes come out for five minutes go in for 30 minutes go off for five minutes there for three hours and that showed like massive spikes in hgh uh human growth hormone natural hgh production but they're also saying again doing this four to seven times also increases human growth hormones probably not by a 10 factor um but maybe like three to five times which is still great you know from a replenishment recovery perspective in your body so there's so many good things that that saunas do and this, the 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 ruling's still out on whether or not um, infrared saunas provide the same level as your traditional wet saunas, you, you know that you have out there. Um, and the data is starting to look like yes, infrared saunas by raising those temperatures up same level, increasing your body temperature has the same type of stimulation and effect um, as both. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, I have a sauna in my house that I invested in. It wasn't for um, the cardiovascular benefits. It was for, you know, recovery for me, because I, I noticed that when I go into a sauna, uh, I recover much faster. So I try to get at least four in a week um, so that I feel recovered, replenished, you know, you know, the toxicity levels go down everything else there. So if you're looking, Dave, he's going to be in the sauna, popping omega-3 tablets, eating bull's testicles and not smoking. <laughs> well, I can smoke now because I'm taking the omega-3, so it's good. <laughs> So we're all good. <laughs> right. I think we'll wrap it up there. So remember, take your vitamins, eat your food, drink your water, be nice to people, and we'll see you next week. See you next week, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.